Hi there, and welcome to the first virtual web whale festival. My name is Douglas Lovell. I work at the Whale and Dolphin Conservation in Plymouth, Massachusetts. And we are sorry to miss you at Marina Bay in Quincy this year, but we are excited to get in touch with people all across the country and all across the world. We have three terrific days of authors and musicians and storytellers and artists to talk to you about whales. I'm your anchor man, get it? Sea, ocean, whales. Anyway, and so at first I'd like to introduce to you our executive director, Regina Asmutis Sylvia. Hello, Regina, how are you today? Hey, Douglas, we're so excited for our virtual whale festival. We would, of course, love to have it in person, but we can't this year. So we're really happy that we still can bring it to you because whales are awesome and we're going to learn so many cool things about whales. There's so many whales to, to learn about. They have families, they're smart, they travel in groups a lot of times, and there are so many things that they have in common with us. But it's so cool to learn about whales, but it's also cool to learn about how whales are really important in our own lives and how much we need them. Uh, so one of the things that you might not realize is that we need whales to breathe. We need whales if we like to eat fish, we need whales. If we want a healthy climate, we need whales. And so at the top of the ocean surface, there's a whole forest of these tiny little microscopic organisms called phytoplankton. And just like plants on land, they photosynthesize. They use the sun's energy to mix up with some nutrients and they do this really cool chemical reaction and they give off oxygen. So half of the oxygen that you breathe, every other breath you take comes from phytoplankton in the ocean. Phytoplankton is also the base for the marine food web. And so all the fish really depend on phytoplankton. And during photosynthesis, they take in carbon. And so they bring that carbon back into the ocean with them. And that helps to keep the planet healthy. And that helps to mitigate climate change. So phytoplankton are really important, but they need those nutrients brought to them because they can't put their roots in the ocean bottom and the soil. So that's where plants on land get their nutrients. So just like you take vitamins, plants need nutrients too. Where do they get it? Whales bring it to them. And the way whales bring it to them is very cool because whales can't poop under pressure. So they take their bathroom breaks at the surface and those bathroom breaks actually fertilize that phytoplankton. So whales are super, super important to phytoplankton. Phytoplankton is super important to us. So we really need whales. We need lots and lots of whales to help us have enough oxygen, to help us have enough fish, to help us really kind of regulate the climate. And for our job is to try and keep whales safe so that we can have whales doing their really important job in the environment. And you're going to meet some people over the next few days that help also keep whales safe by getting some debris out of the ocean and doing some really cool things with it. And you're going to meet people who help to teach about whales in really cool ways. So if you like whales, you don't have to just be a scientist. You can be an artist. You can be a musician. You can be somebody who helps to pick up marine debris. You can do all kinds of different things that can help whales. And so that's what we're gonna learn at the Whale Festival. We're super excited to have you and hope that you enjoy the next few days. And I'm gonna turn it back over to you, Douglas. Thanks, Regina. That's, I, I, I never knew. I mean, I, I don't know about whale poop. When I started at WDC, people were talking about whale poop. I didn't know how important it was. And if you talk to your parents, you can say, we talked about poop today. The other thing they might remember is uh, every other breath you take, ask them about that song from Sting. Anyway, we will be talking with, uh, next we'll talk about an artist who takes recyclables and turns them into art. Bernard, who's gonna to talk to us about recycled materials that she uses to make sculptures in public, in the public domain. And these sculptures often move. They're often kinetic, which means they move. So Kim, would you tell me more about that? Yeah, so because I have a background in dance and like all things that move, I started making kinetic sculpture about 10 years ago. And I most often work with recycled materials. So I collect materials that have had a, a previous life and upcycle them into sculpture. That's fabulous. And I was looking at your website and you invite uh, people to send you materials. Can you? Say more what you'd like us to send you. Right. So right now I'm building a portable upcycling machine for plastic. So it's going to have four units. Uh, plastic goes into one end. So I'm inviting 
the public to collect plastic for me, one through seven, um, plastic, clean plastic. And I'm gonna be shredding that plastic and compressing it, heating it and extruding it into molds and creating sculpture with it. So the plastic will all be recycled and then it'll have a new life as a sculpture. So when you say one through seven, you're talking about the little number on the bottom of the recyclable. Right. So it'll have that triangle, reduce, reuse, recycle, and then it'll have number two on the bottom or number four or something like that. Exactly. And I'm especially looking for colorful plastic. Right. So you want really bright colors and you want it to be clean. You don't want us to send you any dirty plastic. But I prefer it were clean. It just saves me the time of having to clean everybody's plastic. So okay. everyone do their part, that's great. And take the label off as well. Okay, so can you tell us more, is it the ocean wave sculpt that you're gonna talk about today? Yeah, so I'm gonna tell you about four different projects, one of which is a clean ocean wave sculpture. I refer to it as cows for short. Cow, yeah. Cows. And that was a project that I did with students at the University of New England, where we collected plastic from the ocean and turned it into an installation in the Marine Science Center. I'm also gonna be talking about an amphibious tiny house, which is another project I built with those students to create a floating tiny house. And mm -hmm. other projects are a BYOB, bring your own bag project that I did in my local library to encourage people to reuse um, nylon bags instead of getting plastic bags every time they go to the grocery store. And also my portable upcycling machine for plastic as well. Well, I'm not gonna get in the way. You, you take it away, Kim. Okay, here we go. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Kim Bernard and I live in Rockland, Maine, and I'm an artist, and I like to make work that is public, uses recycled materials, is interactive, which means you get to touch it, involves the community, I like to get people involved in making my work with me, and is kinetic, which means that it moves. In 2016, I was an artist in residence at the University of New England in Bitterford, Maine. One of my projects was to create a clean ocean wave sculpture. The idea came about when I learned about the International Coastal Cleanup Day. A marine pollution class was planning to pick up ocean debris on local beaches. I caught them just in time and asked that instead of properly disposing of the trash after collecting it, that instead they give it to me for a sculptural installation. My work study students and I painted a trash bin with a wave on it. We placed it on the campus and encouraged students, friends, and strangers to pick up ocean debris and deposit the trash in the bin. The students were diligently collecting data on what we gathered. In total, 88 plastic bottles, 71 cans, 18 lobster trap pieces, 8 shoes, 7 glass bottles, 4 golf balls, 4 shotgun shells, 3 hats, 1 dog toy, 1 horseshoe, 1 plastic tarp, 1 pink kiddie pool, 1 scarf, 1 CD case, 1 portable scale, 1 iron pipe, 1 gift card, and lots of plastic bags, food wrappers, fish line, and nets. We then hung a loom of stainless steel wire on the Marine Science Center lobby stair rails. For three days, we engaged the UNE community in a big trash weaving effort. UNE students, staff, faculty, and even some of my friends and family participated. The goal of the project was to engage the university community and raise awareness about just how much ocean debris washes up on our shores and how vitally important it is for us all to keep our oceans clean. The Clean Ocean Wave Sculpture is now on permanent display at the Marine Science Center at the University of New England. project I initiated at the University of New England was to work with students to design an amphibious tiny house. There are plenty of tiny houses around, but what was unique about our tiny house was that it was to be amphibious, like a duck who lives on land and water. 
The Amphibious Tiny House team was a collaborative group of students, faculty, and staff who, just for fun, designed a see-through bottom tiny house that could float, be trailered, or parked anywhere. Our collaborative team met weekly and together we brainstorm ideas and in true think tank style, divided and conquered by breaking into smaller teams based on interests, abilities, and skills. This multidisciplinary project required input from about as wide a range of departments as one could imagine. Students from all departments were encouraged to participate in this project, especially marine science, ocean studies, aquaculture and aquarium science, environmental sciences, business and entrepreneurship, math, physics, animal behavior, boat building, creative writing, communications, education, social work, and of course, art and design. Our amphibious tiny house was designed to be completely off the grid to gather and store wind and solar power. We made decisions about the roof style, taking into consideration a pleasing design, aerodynamics, low cost, and the benefits of solar modules versus flexible solar membranes. We designed the footprint of our tiny house to be eight feet by 16 feet, with an overall length of the pontoons to be 24 feet long. Considering the limited volume, every square inch was to be utilized most efficiently, be multifunctional, and of course, be well designed and aesthetically pleasing. Other guiding and limiting factors to consider were building codes, harbor restrictions, vehicle size restrictions, DMV requirements like lights and blinkers, the availability, sustainability, and costs of our building materials. With the choice of a composting toilet, which the Environmental Club adopted as their project, we would avoid needing a holding tank or pump out. The Aquarium Science class took on the ambitious project of developing aquaponics, where we could grow leafy greens like kale, Swiss chard, and arugula in water. The amphibious tiny house was always meant to be low budget, affordable, and mass producible. Having received funding from the Ellis Beauregard Foundation, our team built the Amphibious Tiny House. Ultimately, we donated our Amphibious Tiny House to the College of the Atlantic, where they use her as a floating guest house. All of our R&D, material list, and building instructions were fully documented and are available on our website so anyone is able to see or use our designs, supply lists, and instructions for free. Have a look at www.amphibiousTinyHouse.org. Here's a project I created last year called Bring Your Own Bag. Do you remember the movie, The Graduate, where Mr. McGuire says to Ben, I just want to say one word to you, just one word. Are you listening? Plastics. There's a great future in plastics. Think about it. Will you think about it? In the 1960s, plastics were just becoming popular, even though this novel material made of petroleum had been around since 1907. Plastics are incredibly versatile and allow us to store things easily and cheaply, but plastic is bad for the environment. Next year, 300 million tons of plastic will be produced worldwide. Every year, the average American throws away 105 pounds of plastic. That includes 35 billion plastic bottles and 100 billion plastic bags. Only 5% of the world's plastic is recycled. Virtually every piece of plastic ever made still exists. The good news is that over time, sunlight breaks plastic down into smaller bits. The bad news is that these plastic particles are then eaten by wildlife, which can kill them, get into our food, our water, and into us. Plastic is a substance our earth cannot digest, and neither can we. Last year, the issue of banning single-use plastic bags came up with our city council in Rockland, Maine. 
As a resident and a huge supporter, I showed up to support the plastic bag ban. I'm happy to say that our town passed a ban on single-use plastic bags. Right about the same time, I thought, wouldn't it be cool to do a sculptural installation at the Rockland Public Library to celebrate the bag ban passing? I got a thumbs up from the library, then wrote a project grant through the Maine Arts Commission. I searched the web to find just the right style bag, the right color palette, the right material, at the right price, and made a deal with the company to purchase in bulk at less than wholesale. Then I was awarded a grant to buy 300 high quality ripstop nylon reusable shopping bags. The bag showed up on my doorstep, all rolled up in these compact, easy to ship potato sized balls that fit nicely into your pocket or purse. After my students and I tried to learn how to juggle, played hacky sack and toss with them, I got down to the business of opening them all up tumbling them in the dryer to de-wrinkle them, color sorted them, stacked them, all the while thinking about how I was going to hang them at the library. After the installation of the 300 nylon bags hung in the library for three months, I dismantled the installation, then invited the public to come into the library and take away one bag each for free. Trash, it's such a problem. What can we do? Recycling is not the only solution. We can refuse disposable plastic, bring reusable items with us, purchase projects in sustainable packaging, bring our own to-go container or doggy bag, pack a lunch and bring a spork, and help make hankies cool again. Consider buying a bamboo toothbrush instead of a plastic one. Bring our own water jug instead of buying bottled water. Bring a travel mug into a cafe instead of using a disposable cup. Say no thanks to plastic straws. Keep a cloth towel handy instead of using paper towels. And if nothing else, take the pledge to from now on, bring your reusable shopping bags into the store. Our environment is one of the most critical global issues we all face today. If we don't address climate change, global warming, our increasing carbon footprint, overconsumption, and the depletion of natural resources, we'll all suffer the consequences. Waste reduction and disposal are issues that we can all address locally by reducing our consumption of goods made from raw materials and committing to recycling whenever possible. For years now, I've struggled with the dilemma of using raw materials to make art and feeling hypocritical that I advocate to reduce, reuse, recycle, yet use those very same raw materials in my creative work. For the last several years, I've begun using recycled materials, ocean debris, bicycle inner tubes, bowling balls, and reusable nylon bags, for example. This accounts for a fraction of my work but my goal is to have 100% of my sculptural work be created out of recycled materials, ideally out of a material that can be shaped and molded and is durable, upcycled plastic. I'm currently building a portable upcycling machine for plastic. In researching plastic recycling machine designs, I found preciousplastic.com an online open source with blueprints, CAD designs to follow and adapt if necessary, and helpful information about assembly. The plastic upcycling machine will have four components, a shredding machine, an injection machine, a compression machine, and an extrusion machine. All four machines will be compact and portable, allowing me to create at schools, art centers, communities, institutions, and museums, after being encouraged to collect plastic, deposit their plastic waste into one end and a new malleable plastic will emerge from the other end. I will then, with the participation of the local community, use the newly upcycled plastic to create an on-site sculptural installation. I'm excited to see all the different ways that I can coil build and extrude plastic, 
create molds to fill with plastic and 3D print with the extruded plastic coils. One challenge in working with recycled materials is that it often looks like the junk that it is. My intention is for the upcycled plastic components to become sculptural installations that transcend their source, not look like recycled plastic, but instead be beautiful, inviting, and engaging. For this reason, the project of building a plastic upcycling machine is ideal. Hey, thanks for watching. I really appreciate your interest in my work. I love it when art and science collide. If you are interested in getting involved in my portable upcycling machine for plastic project, you can help out by collecting plastic. I especially want clean, label-free, colorful plastic numbers one through seven. You can get in touch with me through my website or by emailing me at info at kimbernard.com. I hope you'll follow this project and my future projects on my website at kimbernard.com and follow me on Facebook and Instagram. Wow, Kim, thank you so much. That was fabulous. I, I did not know that we could recycle, reduce, and reuse so many plastics and use them for fabulous artwork in the community. Now we're going to talk to a special guest from a group called Ocean Soul, all the way from Kenya, and we're going to meet Aaron. Aaron? Hi, Aaron. How are you doing? Hi. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm terrific. We are a company that is a charity and social enterprise that basically takes flip-flops like these, if you can see these very dirty flip-flops that we mm -hmm. found on the ocean just today, because today is Ocean Ocean Day, World Ocean Day, and we found these flip-flops, and these flip-flops are collected by my team up and down the northern coast of, of Kenya, and we clean them, and then we make art, and you can see this gorgeous giraffe behind me. He's a life-size um, giraffe that we have made, but we have also made, um, which is always so exciting for especially young people, like little elephants. Wow, and how make, beautiful. Yes, we, and we make rhinos. Um, this rhino in particular is symbolizing, obviously, the endangered species. So these are things we make. So we try to make our art both to discuss ocean conservation, but also sometimes to make pieces that represent other impacts in, in our world, whether it's endangered species or whether it's some type of statement piece that a business or a charity or foundation want to make. So that's what we do. So let me tell you a little bit about how we do it. So we organize beach cleanups every week. These communities go out, they clean our beaches, and you'd be astounded by how many uh, we find. Currently, we recycle one ton of flip-flops a week um, that we find on our beaches and waterways. You ask, why are there so many flip-flops? The problem is we are out in this hot, you know, kind of communities in India, China, Indonesia, Malaysia. We have a lot of people and a lot of people kind of working at the poverty line. So about three and a half billion people a year buy flip-flops. Now these flip-flops are not our expensive United States flip-flops. These are flip-flops that are about a dollar to three dollars. Um, and people wear them for about six months and then they discard them. You know, the people themselves are, um, you know, responsible. But in that, they go into dump sites and they can't dispose very well. So they get very thick and they start to build mass then they kind of create a volume of leakage and they start to leak and they get into the waterways, they mm. get into clean water and they start to make their way to the ocean. Once they're in the ocean, they're similar to like a whale. We know how whales migrate all around the world to keep moving, to feed, to, to um, procreate. Flip-flops do the same. They get caught up in this migration path called tides and they end up then on our beaches. So we've discovered this issue about 10 years ago 
in the northern part of Kenya on an island called Kiwayu. That is where some women were really um, looking at the beaches so dirty and the turtles were unable to lay their nests. So they started cleaning beaches. And then the kids started to play with the flip-flops and make toys for their own entertainment. And that has evolved into this project and this company. So um, it's quite a unique start. Um, we're very proud that we recycle you know, over a million flip-flops a year, a ton a week. We employ nearly 100 people on our project. That impacts probably another tenfold of people through our business, whether it's buying food, truck drivers, community workers. We're very proud that we're a circular economy. We take our debris from our art and we um, shred it into mattresses that we make for refugees. So, you know, we do everything we can not to, you know, kind of continue um, and, and kind of make it circular so that we're cleaning things. We don't leave a footprint um, in terms of our business and our community projects. So that's kind of a bit about uh, Ocean Soul. Um, I think you'll hear more through some videos and through some of my team members to show exactly how do we make this art. Okay, so Aaron and Ocean Soul have prepared a special video for us that we're gonna take a look at and then we're gonna meet some of the artists who do the creations. My name is Joe Mwakiremba. I am uh, International Sales Manager at Ocean Soul. Uh, 2018 has been an amazing year for Ocean Soul. What I love the most is uh, what we're able to do at the end of the, uh, the year. The, uh, the impact, uh, the number of flippers we're able to collect and recycle at the end of the year. Um, the fact that we're able to uh, employ, right now I think Ocean Soul is employing about 75 artists. So the fact that we're able to do that, for me that's a, a big positive. The biggest things that we've, we've been able to do this year is actually being able to travel outside of the country and, and, and sell our products and, and, and spread our gospel even more. Um, this year uh, in, uh, in uh, September we managed to go to the Canadian National Exhibition. We were making a life-size uh, baby elephant during the event and we had a buyer that came and, and bought it while it's still being made. Uh, tomorrow we're off to uh, Barcelona uh, for another exhibition and we think that we're going to have another splash. In 2018, we're still partnering uh, with the women uh, group of uh, Kiwayu who help us uh, make beautiful beaded curtains and bracelets uh, from the coast. We were able to facilitate and participate in uh, beach cleanup efforts at the coast, uh, which we managed to collect uh, um, thousands of kilograms of flip flops. This year we uh, managed to team up with an international brand called Sister Beachwear. Uh, so what happened is we were, were able to sell to them our products and uh, they were able to as well donate to our foundation. Uh, but what's amazing is that next year we're going, we're going to partner with them and make a, a shoe that's going to be made out of uh, recycled material. We've also made uh, amazing masterpieces. Um, for example, at the beginning of the year, we made uh, two uh, three meter tall camels, which were going out uh, to the Netherlands. Um, we've made uh, a life size lion uh, for an Irish embassy, which was amazing. Uh, we've also made um, about five uh, two meter tall uh, bumblebees. I don't know if you've noticed, but the, uh, the bumblebee is now also uh, have been included as an in endangered species. Uh, this year. Uh, these masterpieces alone uh, have helped us uh, recycle hundreds of thousands of flip-flops so far. In June we had a video go viral which was uh, produced by 60 Seconds in the Dark. Uh, this video alone is now at 150 million uh, views which is amazing. And from this we've, we've gotten hundreds and thousands of, um, 
of inquiries, which has, has given us amazing exposure um, this year alone. Without our soulmate support, none of this would ever be possible. So thank you so much. In 2019, we're excited to launch the Ocean Soul SOUL Foundation, and so we'll keep you posted. Joe, that was amazing. 2,000 pounds of flip-flops a week and millions and right. millions of pounds of flip-flops a year. And you're making beautifully co colored artwork that's sensational. Tell me more. Yeah, yeah so amazing. Uh, so that was then. Uh, so a lot has happened since uh, uh, that video was taken. Uh, for example, last year, uh, we attended a West to Wonder uh, exhibition in Vancouver, Canada, where we made an amazing five meter long orca, for example. It's just an amazing piece that we made. Uh, we've, we've, we've also done a, a, a massive dragon, which we shipped out to the Netherlands, a uh, four meter tall giraffe, which we sent out to France. Um, here's something that happened uh, recently. Um, we now have a fulfillment center in Florida where we are uh, sending out all of our wholesale orders and retail orders from there. So you no longer have to, we no longer have to send all of our orders from Nairobi. But so you can, when you order from our web shop, we send them out uh, from uh, Florida. So this is an amazing thing that we did. Um, we have uh, a colleague at the coast also that's uh, coordinating all of the beach cleanup efforts called Lydian. So we are able to get all of our flip flops from there and ship to Nairobi for our users here in Nairobi. And sensational. So you do a beach cleanup a week, according to Aaron. And then. Yeah, so and go ahead. Yeah, so there's a, week, a weekly beach cleanup efforts that we do from the coast that will help us get the material which we use here, the, uh, which we use them here in Nairobi. And then what do you do? Um, so, uh, so once they arrive here, they are uh, weighed. And so these collectors are actually paid um, uh, about 30 shillings per kilogram. That's about 30 US cents per kilogram. Once they are paid, uh, the material or the flip flops are then washed, cleaned, uh, uh, let to dry before our covers use them to make sculptures. This is a pile of flip flops. This is this pile of flip flops already uh, cleaned, uh, washed, and uh, let to dry. Uh, with me actually today is jo one of the artists, uh, Jonathan, who is going to demonstrate to you guys Hi. how we uh, do everything from scratch. Jonathan, take it away. So I'll show you the process that where these are our flip flops. And I'll show you how to make a mobile stuff like this. So the process is you have the cutouts where you have the different cutouts from the like cookie cutter. Then from there, you can use the scissors to cut it because in the process of cutting the shape you need, you can't use the knife. The knife is the only thing you can use on the supervision of an adult. So the process is, you can see our uh, different cutouts from the art star. Then you have the chuck, you have also seals, and then you have also turtles. So from these cutouts, you can get these chips, which are messing here. So with these chips, you can make your mobile. So the other process, you have to have a string to make a mobile. I want to show you. So you have to put your string in the sculpture, and then you have to have a place where you pull out your your needle. Amazing things! So like you can see, this one is already in the string. So you can put more according to the size you need. So. Of our off cuts, you can make other stuff like a messing stuff. Like you can do butterfly, you can see from this one. So, these are butterfly made of off cuts, and then the other thing you can make is you can do a, a mosaic where I can show you one of our the one we have done here already. So, this is our mosaic. So, you can see how it's amazing. You 
So that's how we do with our cycle philosophy. And it's amazing work. So we are excited to do it. Oh, that was sensational. What a, what a fabulous, there's unlimited potential in what you can make. Sure, it's nice and we are making more stuff here and we are, all the stuff are excited to be part of the cycle. Okay, well, there's so many ideas out there and you're coming up with new ideas every day. Sure, yeah, every time we have new ideas, we have also a good staff support and then teamwork works as well. Well, thank you so much. That was fabulous. Do you want to show the rest of the team that's there today? Sure. Sure, yeah, you can. Yeah, actually, this is our pile. So, in our actual case, a big. So, these are the rest of the team where I can show you. This guy is working on a bee. So, these are a medium large bee. So, actually, all the process now here, yeah, as you can see, we have other stuff here. Like how long does it take to make a bee? Yeah. Oh, wow. Wow. Closer, and there's another amazing stuff here around the workshop. You can see a big panda where we have a gorilla. Sensational. And this is Jaguar. Jaguar. And then we have a polar bear. This guy here. Polar bear? Right. Wow. How long does it take an ant an anteater? Yeah, for the mass of pieces take longer time. Like for a group of staff, not one person, so it's you have to do as a group. Mm -hmm. So about how long in hours? Sure, it takes about one month, two weeks, two months, depending on the size. Okay. Wow. That's amazing. Well, thank you so much. I am thrilled. And the, the, the artists, the artisans, the sculptures, everything that you guys are doing are, is fabulous. Thank you. Bye, guys. See you. Bye, Jonathan. Thank you so much. I am, I, I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded about how the great work you're doing and, uh, Every day making the oceans and the planet a better place to live. You're welcome. You appreciate it. Sensational. Thank you, Aaron, Joe, and Jonathan. Did you guys like those sculptures? Weren't they amazing? Do you want a chance to win one of those sculptures? You can go to whales.org and click on the Whale Festival banner, register, and make sure you're a resident of the United States, any age, and possibly win one of those sculptures worth $200. Um, tomorrow at three o'clock, we have an author, a musician, and an artist who are going to talk about humpback whales. It's a true story of Ibis the humpback whale that was entangled. And we're going to have John Himmelman talk about his book. And then we're going to have Steve Shook talk about the song that he wrote when he was inspired by the book and then have Rich Dolan talk about how to make a, uh, a humpback whale fluke. On Thursday, please tune in at three o'clock also, your chance to ask the whale scientists questions. So register, ask the question as you register, it'll get sent to the whale scientists and we'll answer them at three o'clock p.m. Regina talked to you about the health of the oceans and about our planet. Remember all the things that Kim talked about and that Ocean Soul talked about keeping our planet healthy, keeping the oceans healthy, keeping our whales, our phytoplankton, our fish healthy are things that you can do each and every day. And I wanted to thank all you supporters out there who support WDC. A special thanks to Sheehan Family Companies who have been involved with environmental and education concerns throughout the Massachusetts region for close to 100 years and also Mass Environmental Trust. Hi, Meg, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. How are you, Doug? I'm well. Thank you so much for the opportunity to support the Whale Festival this year. 
We are really excited to be able to participate in this great global event. I'm from the Sheehan Family Companies. One of the owners of that family business is over 100 years old and started in Plymouth. Very humble beginnings. And like everyone who lives and grows up and works around Cape Cod and Plymouth and surrounding regions, we have just grown so uh, fond of the beaches, um, Cape Cod Bay, sailing and boating, and learning about the wonderful animals that migrate through the fish and the whales. And the work of your organization has really captured our imagination. In the 1980s, we supported the Adopt-A-Whale program. That was for our first um, involvement with this particular cause, and it really sparked an interest in learning about the whales in Cape Cod Bay and their migration patterns, helping to identify them by their flukes and giving them a name. I believe we adopted Othello at one point. I hope Othello is still around. And so thank you very much. And this has really led to a lifelong passion for myself and also for my son, who's now a free diver living in Australia and studying sperm whales um, in East Timor. And the acoustics and the habits of these whales are just so amazing and fantastic. So thank you for helping us to learn about them and protect them. Well, thank you, Meg. I look forward to seeing Alex's photographs very soon and to meeting him in person one day when I get to Australia, East Timor, or here in the States. Thank you, Doug. Well, that was so great, Meg. Thank you so much. I know that the Wi-Fi up in the North Woods of New Hampshire is a little spotty, so we got the essence of your message, which is fabulous. And we're going to be joined by Kim Tillis of the Mass Environmental Trust. Kim? Hello, Douglas. Thank you for having me. Um, I am a, a proud team member of the Mass Environmental Trust. Um, there's three of us that work for the trust. We are a state, um, we're housed within the state of Massachusetts, but we are really not a state agency. Um, we are a small grant making organization that was started in 1988 um, from a, a settlement from um, the state polluting the harbor with $2 million. Wow. Okay, and how how do you get the monies now to give out to environmental concerns all throughout Massachusetts? So this is really important because this is where anyone in Massachusetts can help. Um, we sell license plates through the Registry of, of Motor Vehicles. They're special license plates that um, support the environment. The right well one is the most famous and well known. There's also an RT, which is Roseate Tern, which is also an endangered species. And then we have um, two, the Leaping Brook Trout and the Blackstone Valley Mill and the new and upcoming striper plate, which uh, will be very exciting. But this money is so important. And I always call it a no brainer. Every two years you have to register your vehicle in Massachusetts and it costs $60 to re renew your license. For an extra 40, which is $20 a year and a donation, <laughs> you can get one of these plates and the money goes to the most amazing things. One of the most important whale related things is um, the entangled whales that uh, are right off our waters and in Maine and, and all over the world, really. Um, mm -hmm. They get caught in fishing ropes. Your money from mass helps get those whales disentangled. It, it, we directly support the, the rescue response team every year for several well, years. Well, it's funny that you should mention that, Kim. We have tomorrow, we have author John Hibbelman Himmelman, who wrote the story Ibis about a whale that was entangled off of uh, Provincetown. That's amazing. Uh, yeah, when people buy one of our um, right whale or rosy turn plates, guess what you're supporting? You are helping whales that get entangled in ropes right off of our coast. And well, that yeah, accidental entanglement is an issue. And I know that the lobstermen and the whale advocates are working together to help make sure that that doesn't happen. There's a, a lot of money, about $250,000 a year from the license plate goes to the rescue team that disentangles whales. And then um, about 50, even more sometimes, I, I blew that, sorry, um, helps to develop the uh, weak link rope. So if whales do become entangled, they can break free. 
That's tremendous. Thank you so much, Kim. Appreciate it. Thanks for being here with us today. Thank you very much. Well, that wraps up our first day of our whale festival. It's been a tremendous day from Kim Bernard to Regina to Ocean Soul to our sponsors. Thank you so much. Be sure to tune in tomorrow at three o'clock on Facebook Live and YouTube Live when we talk with author John Himmelman, musician Steve Shook, and uh, artist Rich Dolan. And again on Thursday at 3 p.m. when we ask some whale experts your favorite questions. Good night and have a great tomorrow. <laughs>